What is up, everybody, and welcome to Pop Stream, the official streaming show from your friendly neighborhood nerds at Pop Culture Classroom, where your community comes together to talk about your media because this is your Pop Stream. I'm one of your hosts, Matt Slater. I'm the education program manager here at PCC. You can find me at Maddie Slay on Twitter, which I hope all of you do. Um, unfortunately, my usual co-host, Tajan, could not be able to join us tonight, but filling our rotating cast seat in her first appearance on this season of PopStream is Sydney Haven. Welcome back, Sydney. Hi, it's good to be back. Sydney, what's the one thing that you read or watched or played since we went on break that you just got to tell everybody about? Oh, my gosh. Um I, I thought about this and I, I'm not prepared for the question. Um, I watched, I haven't gotten all the way through, but I've been watching the shadow and bone adaptation on Netflix. Ooh, okay. I haven't good. gotten to it yet. Excellent. <laughs> excellent. Well, tonight we're talking remakes and reboots because at the moment we're just surrounded by all of them in pop culture, right? This year we're seeing some really high profile releases like Dune and the matrix and Cruella and other properties in games and comics are being rebooted all the time. So we thought we'd take a deep dive and dissect the reboot and remake zeitgeist uh, and talk about what it means for the greater landscape of media and pop culture. And to help us do that, that. We couldn't think of anyone better than tonight's guest, a comic writer known for her work on Bitch Planet, Pretty Deadly, Aquaman, and Captain Marvel, amongst many, many others. We have Kelly Sue DeConnick with us tonight. How are you doing, Kelly Sue? I am well. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thank you so much for being here. We really can't wait to talk to you about reboots and remakes tonight and get some of your insight having, you know, rebooted some characters yourself. Um, but as I was telling you before pre-show uh, or before the show, I am a pop culture nerd by way of video games. And in the last few years have kind of gotten into comics and fell in, fallen in love with comics. But when it comes to like history and, you know, all the uh, minutia that a lot of comic uh, lifelong fans know, I'm not there. So for anyone who's on my page, for anyone out there like me, can you tell us how long have you been writing comics and why comics? Um, I've been writing comics less than 20 years and more than 15. Somewhere <laughs> in here. I'm not, I, I haven't quite done the math. Um, and uh, why comics? Because uh, they're the best. Um, I grew up reading comics. I grew up on uh, Air Force bases. And so, um, so it's a, a very familiar language to me. Um, I'm also, I have a theater background. I, I have a theater degree from the University of Texas. And so comics are a, um, or at least the way, there are different models, but the way that I work in comics, it's a, it's a collaborative art form, very much mm -hmm. like theater. I also have a theater degree from Texas Christian University. Oh, um, so another Texas school. Yeah, yeah. But I could definitely get those influences as I was reading some of your works over the last couple of days. Um, right. That's Awesome. What are, so theater seems to be like a big fandom thing that you love. What are some of the other, like, is there any other nerd culture that you love or what other things do you get nerdy about? I mean, I get nerdy about kind of everything. Cause okay. We'd get along then. Okay. Um, but yeah, you, you got to catch those fish in animal crossing. That's excellent. That's <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, I, I have, I have, I'm really nerdy about perfumes. Um, like I have a, I have a really ridiculous, perfume and perfume sam sample collection. Um, and I don't expect anyone here to go deep, deep nerd on, on perfumes with me, but like, and, um, uh, I've been, I, I, I like to read, <laughs> I read different oral histories of metal music. That's like, kind yes. of so, um, <laughs> I'm reading an oral history of, of hair bands right now. Um, so yeah, so 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 my my nerd is is many and broad, but it's it's not your conventional. Like I'm not gonna throw down for like, you know, like I, like there's in a, a, uh, the the show rundown. It was like, uh, you know, Godzilla, or Kong, yeah, like Kong, Kong or Godzilla, Godzilla right? Yeah, like, well, let's see. I, both of those things make me think of my son, uh, <laughs> and uh, we we threw him a fifth grade or a fifth fifth year five-year-old Godzilla birthday party um but I don't think I've ever seen a Godzilla movie 
um, I mean, you absorb a lot through the culture. I know a lot. I, know, I mean, I know Mothra. I know the singing. I know the mm-hmm, whole, but mm-hmm. I've got, you know, King Ghidera because of all of the action figures, but, but I don't think I've ever seen one. And I took him to see Kong on Broadway and, uh, and he is such a, my son has such a soft spot for like the misunderstood monsters, you know, mm, okay. Uh, okay. that he was, um, sobbing uncontrollably so that was a <laughs> that's so cute and it's so sweet but also so terrible um <laughs> like i knew one of the puppeteers and so we were i was like you know if you want to go to the stage door and we can meet him and he was like no i just want to go back to the hotel you know oh my gosh <laughs> Um, it's so cool that you get to like share that with him and like share in his nerdiness. Uh, whenever we do professional developments with pop culture classroom, we go out to, you know, teachers and we say, uh, we ask them, what are they nerding out about? And a lot of them, they get kind of clinched at first because they're like, I don't watch the same things that my kids watch. I don't know what Marvel movies they're into or whatever. But then when they open up about, I'm nerdy about being a mom. I'm nerdy about gardening. That connects people and you see people light up in the room. So whatever that nerddom is for you, help it make connections with other people. And you know, and like, and there's a, like my first nerddom was probably um, Greek mythology. Yeah. And you can draw a very direct line from that through Wonder Woman comics, mm-hmm. through Neil Gaiman and Sandman, mm-hmm. through the work that I do today. Very, Absolutely. You know? Um, so it's all there. <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, uh, Kelly Sue, uh, speaking of reboots and remakes that uh, Kong, uh, the musical could maybe be considered like a remix somewhere in there. Um, I can't wait to jump into this with you and Sydney, uh, which we'll do in just a moment. But before that, I do want to give some quick housekeeping for all the folks out there listening to PopStream. In case you're new here, and if you are the warmest of welcomes to you, PopStream is live every first and third Thursday of the month on YouTube, Facebook, Twitch, and Twitter for real-time conversations conversation, games, and more. The chat is where you want to be, I promise. So if you're watching live now, I want you to shout out some of your favorite works by Kelly Sue. Uh, I've been reading Bitch Planet and Pretty Deadly over the last couple days and I've fallen in love with them. I can't wait to go back and read some more. Um, But even if you can't watch live, even if that time doesn't work for you, you can always find episodes on demand on YouTube and major podcast services. Our next episode, like every third Thursday edition of PopStream, is the PopStream Learning Lounge, which is our show specifically for educators, librarians, and parents working to bring pop culture into their learning settings. We'll be talking anime in the classroom with award-winning writer and educator and CEO of Weird enough productions tony weaver jr but this episode of pop stream is all about the fans like you every first thursday we cover comics graphic novels and manga film and tv and gaming and pop stream has plenty of guest authors creators and other folk to enrich your pop culture experiences just like on our last episode where we talked with guest shauna potter front person of the band war on women and author of making spaces safer a guide to giving harassment the boot wherever you work play and gather or like this episode right now where we're getting rebooted y'all like what i did there hey clever um (laughs) i feel like i need a reboot sometimes and just get like the whole reboot treatment just like make me make me pretty please make me modern um (laughs) i hate shopping for clothes so that's what i tell my husband like let's go shopping and please give me the reboot treatment there you go But this year, especially, we are just surrounded by all types of reboots. We have Dune, Matrix, Cruella. They just announced a Highlander reboot. Um, So I want to know, Kelly, Sue, and Sydney, uh, are there any reboots that stick out in your mind as being either really successful or really unsuccessful? We're talking games, movie, TV, comics, in any of those kind of areas. Um, Yeah, I mean, I I would say really successful uh the most interesting ones to me have probably been um Battlestar Galactica Westworld and Watchmen um Mm. uh and those would be in the like giant audiences Mm -hmm. you know um um I guess I didn't know I didn't realize that Battlestar Galactica was a reboot um Really? 
I yeah, I'm I'm not that that's not my my nerd camp, but I, I've only ever heard of Battlestar Galactica. I didn't was there something new that that they put out? Battlestar Galactica was a TV show when I was a kid. Okay. See, this is where the disconnect is. Yes. Um, <laughs> tell me more. <laughs> yeah, so ba Battlestar Galactica was a uh, uh, kind of cheesy but wildly popular um, television show. It starred uh, Richard Hatch. Uh, 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 his ca his character is played by a woman in the in the reboot, and her name is flying right out of my head. Um, <laughs> a short blonde pilot. Um, all right. Well, this is going. Sydney, any, anything? <laughs> no, I haven't seen Battlestar Galactica. I was hoping that somebody else was going to come up with it. Uh, uh, bail us out here. Or I can hear. I can look it up. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So it was. Uh, um, yeah, it was huge. Starbuck. Ah, Thank there you. it is. <laughs> Thank uh, you, Chris. Yes, and uh, yeah, so it was completely, and the Cylons were robots. The Cylons, I mean, like robot robots. Like they did not pass for humans, right? They, they had like eh, eh, these little lights on <laughs> their heads. Um, and uh, yeah, it was, a, it was a giant big deal. So um, now, you did mention Watchmen, which happens to be one of my absolute favorite ones that have has come out recently. Um, that show was absolutely phenomenal. What did you particularly enjoy about that? What makes that a good reboot for you? Um, I think it was really interesting because rather than trying to not... acknowledge some of the problems of the source material and and understand that there are people in my industry who will like there are no problems in the source material it's perfect yeah um but it, it remained respectful of the ideas but rather than ignoring the problems of the source material like zeroed in on them Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, in particular, uh, some it, it, Watchmen's all about the women, mm. you know, and uh, and 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 let's just say that the source material is not. <laughs> you know? Yes, absolutely. Uh huh. <laughs> Yeah, that, oh man, it was one of those, it was just like such a tight 10 episodes. Um, and the performances in it were absolutely fabulous. And I love how, like you said, they took the source material um, and just did something completely new with it and embraced embraced the issues in a way that they could co almost correct them, right? Or uh, address them. I mean, I, I think they were expanding on the ideas, but mm -hmm. also doing so using a different language, sort of using different tools, um, okay. rather than, than, I mean, because the, 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 uh, see, see, I have this, um, I mean, and it's, it's, I'm in a difficult position uh, of not, I don't like to talk about what I don't like about things. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, and so, you know, Watchmen's a really important book. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, I mean, I was supposed to study for a final in when I in college. And like, I like, had a final the next day that I was not really prepared for. And so you read Watchmen instead. Walked <laughs> Watchmen off at my house. And instead, I would say, well, I'm just going to take a look at one of these. <laughs> Let me and take a then, peek. And then I, I read all of Watchmen and then thought about Watchmen rather than studying for my final. <laughs> so it's like, it's, it's, and I don't really regret it. Um, Did it help you pass your final? It was, <laughs> but I remember Watchmen, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, 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 I mean, no, no, 
disrespect, but at the same time, um, you know, there, there are things about it that I think were handled differently in the show where they just kind of zeroed in on them beautifully and powerfully. Yeah. Um, uh, it was just extraordinarily well done, um, top to bottom. I feel like that is one of the things that reboots and remakes allow us to do. That's one of the the great things about them being so popular right now is that we get, we have that opportunity and not every reboot does this by any means, but they have the opportunity to, to revisit the source, source material and make uh, adjustments to how we frame things or how we view things or, you know, how we present characters, how much depth we give them. Um, that is something that I, that I do like to see when it's done correctly. And I think that Watchmen is such a, a, a great example of someone doing that right. Yeah. Um, Sydney, what about you? Are there any uh, reboots that stick out to you as being really successful? Um, I was thinking about like, just in terms of, even just like popularity level. Um, and this isn't really a recent one, but Doctor Who was essentially a reboot, you know, because it had that huge break in between like the original series and then the, the new series. And it was essentially a new series while still being a continuation of the old series. Mm -hmm. um, and it sort of throws back to the old series in a lot of ways that's very respectful to it while still being like something that people can just come in brand new never having seen any of the old stuff and follow along and be like okay this is great you know and still get like what's the core of the show mm -hmm. um and it's obviously still going <laughs> it's been it's been a minute but it's it's you know Something that <laughs> that did that for me was the most recent God of War video game uh, created by Corey Barlog. So back in the early 2000s, God of War was a series where it's all about fighting and there are boobs hanging out and you're fighting, you know, uh, it's just like the most masculine, like let's rip heads and, and everything like that, right? 15 years later, the developer has a child now and his worldview has changed. And so when he develops the, the sequel, which is similar that it's coming back many, many years later, um, continuation technically of the same story, but a very different game. He addresses all these real issues of uh, father son relationships um, and really makes it. He says, like, I'm a different person now than I was then. And so I'm going to make things that matter to me uh, now. And that changes the way that I write. Um I, I, Kelly Sue, you're a mom. Has that changed the way, or does that influence the way that that you write ever? Like, what do you think about? Like, I need to write something that will pass on a, a message. Does it change the way you think about characters? I suspect not the way you're asking. Sure. Yeah. No. In, in any way. <laughs> um. But I mean, I, I'm I'm certainly a different writer at fifty than I was at you know, 25 and, mm. and, and I think part of that is experience. Um, and part of that is, you know, <laughs> frontal lobe development. Um, like <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in different things. I'm, I'm, I don't have, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm bored by uh, uh, what I thought was fascinating mm. when I was younger. Um, sure. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in things that are messy and complex. Um, uh, I don't... Uh, it's harder and harder for me to sort humans into good and bad, you know? I don't... Mm. I, there's no longer anything I can... I'm doesn't hold water in my life experience um, at this point. So I, I think it's, uh, uh, I think I'm, I'm most certainly a, a different writer for every development in my life over the years. Um, and I, I think there are, there are certainly ways that my children, you know, there's a character in Historia that's very influenced by my daughter. Uh, mm. There, a, a lot of Pretty Deadly is very influenced by my son, but I think it is about 
them as people rather than my identity as a mother. Yeah. Uh, although, you know, I'm certainly, I, I write a, I mean, as near as I can tell, I have a bit of mirror blindness. It's hard to talk about your own. It's so interesting how it's much easier to characterize, you know, oh, he writes about this and she writes about that and they write about this. And, but, uh, and then I'm like, you know, but I am infinitely versatile. <laughs> you know, and, and like, you have this idea about yourself and it's not true. You write about the same stuff. You write about your own and it's just harder to see your own. But I have been, Told that I write about identity a lot. And so because I've been through these various identity shifts in my life, you know, like the, 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 it, it was, fa it's fascinating how different, uh, uh, you're treated in the world as a married woman, you know, mm -hmm. like a single woman versus, and then, uh, like as a, uh, as an older woman, you're sort of expected to recede, you know, and like there, there are like, there, there's all of these different things that become these identity shifts. And when you become a, a mother, having the, the sort of questions about like, okay, who am I? How, how do I prioritize? There's a lot of thinking that happens there. Mm. Much longer answer than what you were. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! No, not at all. That's great because I mean, all of our identities change as we get older, and it's really cool to see how that influences or hear you say how that influences your your writing and the the type of things that you write about. Um, a, a funny moment as I was I was reading Captain Marvel um, earlier today, and there's. Uh, a scene where uh, Carol Danvers is talking to Tick, the teenage alien, and um, she just gets real with it, or she gets real with with Tick, and is like, "Look, I'm not putting up with it anymore. I was giving you a slide because you're a teenager, and this is how you react when you're young. But I'm cutting to the chase. Cut the bullshit. Like here we go, right?" And me, as I've never been a parent, but as someone who used to be a teacher, I was like, "I." I know exactly what that feels like, right? That moment where you have to get with the kid and be like, I've been giving you grace and the benefit of the doubt for a long time, but we need to have a real heart to heart talk. Um, yeah. And I just, uh, you know, as we learn how to relate with different people in different ages, I kind of saw that coming out in your writing. And it was really cool to see. Uh, it's funny. It's, it's, and you know, my, um, my experience as a parent is really about trying to learn to listen because mm. I remember so much of um, childhood, you know, and I, I grew up in a different time, but it was, it was, you know, it was so much about, you know, <laughs> and I think like, I remember like, no, you need to let me finish my sentence. I really do have something to control, you know, like, and so um, it's such, such a like important thing to me that my children have, autonomy and be able to finish their sentence and be heard mm -hmm. um, and so that that I think is like number one directive although there is a time at which you're like okay now I've heard you right I only need you to be compliant enough that I can keep you safe okay <laughs> Yep, I have heard you. Now I need you to hear me. Uh, <laughs> well, we talked about reboots that we think have worked really well. Have there been any that stick out that haven't worked really well? Um, I know for me, the one that sticks out in my mind is, did y'all know that they rebooted Heathers? The, yeah. the 1980s film, right? Uh, it's a fantastic musical, first of all. But then they tried to uh, adapt it into a, it was on Stars or some cable network. Um, it had a season. But they did this interesting thing where they made the Heathers. Um, so for this reboot, the Heathers, one of them was a, uh, a gay boy, um, one of the, or a queer man. I'm saying this as a queer man and I'm stumbling over the, the language here. Um, <laughs> but uh, one of them was um, a heavier set girl. And so they took what would be the kids that got made fun of maybe in the 80s version and made them the Heathers of the new high school or the new age, which could have been a cool idea. But then there were some of the issues of the original Heathers, like, I don't know, teenage suicide um, that were not dealt with as well. And so that sticks out to me as something like the, some of the ideas were, were there, but in the execution, it kind of was flawed. Um, anything stick out for you guys as, as reboots that just didn't quite cut it. I, I, you know, when I was trying to think about this earlier, the answer that I came up with, I don't think is actually a reboot. So I don't, mm -hmm. 
Um, I think that's just a sequel. Um, but uh, my, my answer was uh, RoboCop because RoboCop is like maybe one of my all time favorite movies. And so to me, there was only one RoboCop. There was one movie made mm-hmm. and it was perfect and no one ever made another one. Um, and, I, and like, I will fight you. They don't exist. La, 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 la. <laughs> uh, but, but I don't, at, I actually think that that was a, a, that was a poor answer because I, I think those are actually sequels and not, not reboots um, or reimaginings or, you know. There's some gray area there for sure. Yeah. Cause even in a sequel, you're remixing ideas. You're taking some of those ideas and then twisting them up. Right. Yeah. Um, I feel that way about the last of us, uh, game and they're making an HBO adaptation. I, if you're going to give it to anybody, I'm glad it's with HBO, but like, do we need a TV show like seven years after eight years after that game was made? Um, Sydney, anything for you? Um, I honestly, I thought about this a lot and I, I don't know. I couldn't really think of one that I was like, Oh, that was, I didn't like that. That was terrible. Um, but I don't know. I just, I feel like, like with what you're talking about with like the HBO, the, um, the last of us, you know, as somebody who has also played the last of us and loved the last of us, I feel like in a situation like that, I always struggle with a, with a reboot that moves it from like one medium to another where like you have the video game and then you get, you know, a movie or a television series, because I think that certain things work well in certain mediums for a specific reason. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's going to translate to, a television series yeah. you know what i mean like it does sometimes and it doesn't and yeah and, and this is where, where the terminology gets sticky too right so so is that a reboot or is it just an adaptation mm-hmm. you know? yeah um you know we could have that same conversation about watchmen and, you know you could say the watchmen tv series was not a reboot but a sequel, you know, um, uh, and the film, the Watchmen film, uh, which people like to forget exists, um, <laughs> uh, was an adaptation. Right. And, and neither of them really reboots. Um, so. It's kind of weird because a lot of reboots nowadays are even just kind of continuing the story. Um, I'm thinking things like Gilmore Girls. I'm thinking things like even the Animaniacs, like the Animaniacs came back and they were the exact same show that they were, you know, back in the 90s. Um, There wasn't a whole lot. They just kind of restarted it. Right. Right. But. I think regardless of whether we're seeing, you know, sequels coming back from the dead, um, you know, like Matrix, something that has been off for a long time that's coming back now, or really brand new ideas like Cruella or Joker or something like that. Why do you think this idea of reboots and remixes is so um, ubiquitous right now? Like, what is it about the last five, ten years and and kind of going forward? Because it doesn't show any sign of stopping. Are we just running out of ideas or what? Why do you think it's so common right now? It's just, it's just marketing. I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> oh, totally. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a very dull answer, but it's very true. So, uh, you know, the, the, it's all about there being, um, an established audience for the IP and name recognition because, mm. uh, there, there, there are, you know, when I, I again, I, I would just bringing, um, I am an old. Um, so when I was a young person, you know, there were three television stations, right? So, um, it, now you have to cut through so much. You're competing against, uh, you know, in television, television's probably never been better, really. There's so much good TV on. Yeah. Right? We have heard that a lot. Yeah. Uh, and there's, there's so much variety available that, any advantage that anybody has for a, a, a pre-established audience mm-hmm. um, is is what it's all about, and, it, and it's I, I'm afraid it's no more complex than that. It's it's just that's when you go into a pitch meeting, if you are if you are pitching on IP that that corporate family already owns, and mm-hmm. it has. Um, and an established audience and name recognition, you're 10 steps ahead of anybody else. Um, 
So it's it, it just comes down to that. There's, we haven't run out of ideas, um, <laughs> and nor have we run out of a willingness or an interest in making original material. Um, you know, it's just <laughs> harder for that to get seen. It feels it's like just harder to get it on the air. Yeah. Well, I know that you have worked on, you know, established characters a lot, right? So when you are working on characters that somebody else originated or an IP that somebody else has originated, what are some of the things that you think about when you're creating that new, uh, that new work? Um, you know, I, I always go in sort of trying to think about what is, my take, what is my point of view on this character? And then, um, and if it's a, if it's a superhero character, I have a very specific approach where I look for, uh, hi Kitty. Um, <laughs> I look for what their, uh, what, what sort of mythic model they're in, like what are their stories about? And, I, and then I, I also, I try to identify what their core wound is and then connect it to their power set. Um, and then that kind of gives me the story engine uh, that I'm going to use to tell stories, um, you know, for as long as I have signed on to tell stories with that character. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's uh, for, for superheroes, it's a, it's a, it's a very specific approach uh, that I have, but um but you know, with anything, I, I, it's, I was, I was brought a, a horror property, um, to, uh, uh, propose a, a rethinking of, um, they wanted a, a feminist perspective on this property, uh, a couple years ago. And, you know, and I just didn't have a point of view on it, you know, mm. and it, it was, I, I, I didn't feel like there was a feminist point of perspective on this thing. I thought this was like smashing two things together that really, really did not go together. And that um, if I were to do that, I would have to change the things that were appealing about that core material so much that the people who came to it because I was doing it would not want to come to it because of what the source material was. And the people who love the source material we're not going to be there for the things that I was bringing. So I didn't understand who we were making this for. So I ultimately, I took three days, I think, to do a bunch of research and see if I could come up with a take and then ultimately just passed and was like, I don't think this exists. I think you're going to ruin something somebody loves for no real reason, you know? <laughs> uh, I like that. I like that you got to have a reason to ruin not that everything's going to ruin what somebody loves, but if you're going to mess with it, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, right? So if you're going to mess with it, then give it that perspective, right? You know, make yeah. give like, someone that reason. The artist always has to come in with a point of view, you know? Mm -hmm. like you really have to have a take on it. You, and, and I mean, if we... What is the thing that you are bringing to this that is that amplifies something that was already there or looks at something that was already there in in the source material but from a different point of view you know something that we have come to in a in a more contemporary age you know mm -hmm. like so the same problem how is it how, how has it evolved since this thing was made like, right. And we expand on the ideas there. So kind of going along this line, uh, Christy on Facebook asks, when you're rebooting a character, how constrained do you feel to what past writers have written about that character? And I think you were just touching on trying to find that balance. Um, but how much of that previous work, like, I don't know, do you, do you feel that you have to hang on to the majority of it? Or do you kind of take it piecemeal and say, this stays, but maybe not this part? How do you take that I mean, when i when um i've never come on to something that only had one iteration before me yeah that makes sense so um so i usually try to take in as much of the history of the character as i can and then find what is consistent throughout and hold on to that right like what is the thing that is iconic about this character that exists 
um, and transcends all of the different artists that have worked on that character, that whatever that is, is the reason that this character has persisted. And so that has to be honored. And to be honest, it will be. Like he has a way of, like there was a thing with Carol, with uh, Captain Marvel where I had I, I was annoyed in reading all of her stuff where I was like, Carol always fights Carol. Why is Carol always fighting Carol, right? Like, so so whether it was like Carol fighting someone who was, um, who looked like her, like, or was impersonating her or Carol fighting herself from another dimension or Carol, you know, like Carol fighting her, her own inner battles, you know, whatever. I, I had this, I was like, um, I felt it was kind of limiting and a kind of, you know, male perspective on the female character, like, sweetheart, why are you always getting in your own way? You know, and, and, um, and I was like, I'm not gonna do that. And I did straight out of the gate. <laughs> I didn't even see I was doing it. But I think that there's something about those characters that they just sort of work through you. That, that mm -hmm. you're like, I'm gonna, this, these are my ideas and I'm gonna do these things. And they're like, mm -hmm. and this, you know? <laughs> And, and that's why they've stuck around, um, you know, but there are, you know, the, I, I, this is, this is my wildly, um, uh, uh, problematic opinion, but, um, I, I the, pro the most popular character in comics is Batman. Uh, and I think Batman is uh, deeply flawed as a concept. Mm. Um, and, you know, that's fine. I'm not trying to take away Batman from anybody, but uh, like I, I wrote one Batman story because, uh, because they, they gave me the opportunity to work with uh, Klaus Janssen and John Romita Jr. And I was like, Okay, basically, I'm going to write any character. What what character would you like me to write? Because I will write that character if I'm working with with uh, John Romita Jr. and and Klaus Janssen. But uh, and so I was like, I I found a story. Um, but I think the angst ridden, you know, teenage scarred, gothy billionaire vigilante is deeply problematic as a hero. Um, you know, I don't believe in ethical billionaires. So I think that's a problem. Um, I've been intrigued as to how some of the recent works have have treated, especially White Knight, um, the recent Bat Batman White Knight comics that have come out because they do really dive into exactly what you're talking about is like, this is problematic. Like all, all the problems that this man causes, let alone the fact he's got all this money wrapped up in it is, is hugely problematic. So um, I, I love that those have been able to address some of those issues that you're talking about. But yeah, yeah when you look at the broad history of that character, but I mean, there's, there's a lot just in our, you know, we, we, there's a lot we have to accept. It's, it's, it's already hard that comics, superhero comics in particular, I'm talking about actually, um, we externalize conflict as violence, right? So ultimately every story has a violent solution mm -hmm. and there, there are days when that's hard to write, you know. I, I had, I, I had to write a comic, uh, and every comic has to have these big action scenes, you know. Every every superhero comic, I, I should, I, I need to be very specific about that. And I love the superhero comics. Don't get me wrong. I, and I'm not slumming it. I do it because I love it. Mm -hmm. I think it is a wonderful, valuable genre um you know i think it has a lot to say and i think it is very effectively used often um but i also think that there are some things that are that make it hard <laughs> and um uh you know the 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 day of the mass shooting in newtown i was writing a comic 
Mm. And it was very hard to write that day. And it was very hard to, to wrap my brain around how, you know, I, I, we all find ways where, you know, the violence is, you know, incidental, you know, or, um, but ultimately we're writing violence as solutions, you know, or mm. violence is externalization of conflict. Um, and that's that there's days that that's real hard to do. So we touched on this a little bit with reboots. We have opportunities to go back and revisit some things, right? Um, make tweaks based on the current climate, based on things that we've learned, uh, you know, um, do you think that there's an opportunity with reboots, um, specifically in superhero comics, to not cut out the violence, but um, say something more? Um, I, I, I bring this up because I think in Captain Marvel specifically, one thing that I noticed about it was the pacing of it. Um, and that I there's a lot packed in. There's a lot of dialogue, a lot of um, story development, a lot of character development packed into each issue. Um, whereas some other comics, I don't feel there's as much. You do have the the action scenes that take up a lot, maybe with fewer words, and they can be beautiful and stunning. Um, but with reboots, do we have the opportunity to say more either with or, I don't know, at, at, at odds to the violence that we see in comics? I mean, yes. Um, but also, you know, nobody, nobody wants to read a superhero comic about, you know, people talking in diners. <laughs> yes. You know, that, like, <laughs> that is not why we read Batman. No. No. Uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, there, there, there are ways to rethink it and ways to like really sort of examine the metaphor and, you know, I, and I, I continue to write superheroes and I continue to write fantasy violence. Um, and, I, and I'm not saying that, you know, violence and culture in, in popular culture is responsible for violence in the world. Of course. Yeah. It is. Um, but it, how we use those metaphors is something that we, we do, like, I, it's, it's worth thinking about. It is worth mm -hmm. thinking about like what, how are we externalizing conflict? And, um, you know, and, and you got to think about it, you know, also like, you know, just be, what is he cool stuff? You know, like, you know, you really like, that was one of the funnest things about Aquaman was, you know, like mother shark and underwater and like let's let's do like memories encased in these sort of bioluminescent polyps and like, like crazy stuff like that that comics can do or or i asked uh uh robson horka to draw uh like okay if 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 mara is 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 aquakinetic so she can manipulate water right so she could theoretically make a sculpture of um of arthur by pulling the water away from the oxygen in the water right like so she should she could sculpt him in the water out of air um and like it was like can you draw that <laughs> you know, like, that's a really easy thing for me to say can you draw it right and, he did. and it was amazing you know um and there's there's like really cool stuff there but yeah, there are, as we continue to use this language and use these, um, how do we transcend the power fantasy aspect of it, right? Um, so it's it continues to be a power fantasy, but is also, but, but there are other aspects to it as well, right? Yeah, I think we see that in, in video games a lot, too. That industry is having that same sort of, obviously, the power fantasy is what's fun. That's what draws a lot of us to it. But there's the ability to say so much more. Um, also, there's a point that you get to where you're just like, you've got apocalypse fatigue. You know, everything <laughs> bigger and then this and I'm buying this good light. And you're like, and now I don't care anymore. You know, mm. 
and it, and it there's a point where like smaller becomes bigger it's that 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 interesting also um alchemy in writing where the more specific you are the more universal it becomes uh which is which is also strange and fascinating and that's almost circles back to what we talked about at the beginning when we're talking about things that we're nerdy about right and how that those simple things are what where you find the connections yeah. um I found that in uh, Mr. Miracle, the latest run of Mr. Miracle, the way that, um, you know, Tom King dealt with the relationship between Big Barda and, and Scott Free and worked all of that into this beautiful story. Um, yeah. Tom would I, argue with me that, that pe- to- no, totally, they will read a comic about people talking in diners. <laughs> right. Um, so kind of last question here for you. Um, you mentioned that you, a lot of the properties you worked on, many other people before you have worked on those, um, which means likewise, many people have worked on those properties after you, right? Um, how does it feel to see something that you have worked on and put your stamp on and then watch it go into somebody else's hands? I, I imagine that has to be a pretty unique feeling. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't usually read the books like, that immediately follow my runs. Although okay. like, I'm really supportive, but it's sort of like a, a, a like 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 you just you just broke up with your ex, and you broke up on on really good terms, and you want them to like be happy and you want the best for them (laughs) yeah like you do genuinely want them to be happy and go on with their lives but you're not gonna like go to their facebook page right like that's not if you want to be healthy no so (laughs) um so i mean there's a sort of like um you know there's been some really incredible writers that followed me on captain marvel and i love them all to death and we have a, a kind of sisterhood that i'm really into um but I'm very frank in that, like, oh, no, I have not read that. <laughs> you know, like, I love you. I think you are awesome. I wish you re- I wish you well. I- I'm sure your stuff is incredible. And uh, and it is, it is not for me to read, you know. Um, and I, I don't yeah. think there's anything. It, do- it doesn't, it's not like, you know, my take is the one true take. It's not that at all. It's just... Um, I'm just happier this way. I know if it were me, I would be like, oh, I should have done that. Oh, what a great idea. What a great idea. Why didn't I think of that? Right. Yeah, yeah, um, totally. You're just better off not seeing it. Yeah. It's all good. Unless you have to go back to it and then you're going to have to read it, but I haven't had right. to do it yet. So. <laughs> not yet. Not yet. <laughs> yeah. Well, Kelly Sue, this has been so much fun. Um, It has been great talking to you about reboots and remakes. Um, One last time, where can people find your work? And is there anything that you're working on right now that you want to send people in that direction? Um, uh, You can find my work pretty much anywhere you can find comic books, um, uh, which would be like from your local comic book store to uh, any major bookstore or independent bookstores. But, but where do you get books? You should probably go to where you get books. My last name is spelled Dick. D-E-C-O-N-N-I-C-K. Um, and, uh, and I am currently really psyched about this uh, long overdue, but it, it will be out. I don't think they have, announced the date yet, but, um, but I'm working on this, uh, history of the Amazons from the perspective of the Amazons, uh, that is this huge, literally epic project, um, that, uh, is called Historia. That's from DC's Black Label. Uh, If you go to Phil Jimenez's, uh, Instagram, he posts, uh, sneak peeks of it every once in a while. Um, So, yeah, very excited about that. At Kelly Sue, although I'm off of Twitter for the month of June, so uh, um, I just need a break. Not this month. Right. 
And then on Instagram at Kelly Sue D. And then if you just want to text me, you can text my community um, at 503-738-1029. And if you want to get updates um, at that number texted to you when I have books coming out, um, you can text the word milk fed to that number. That's 503-738-1029. And um, if you want semi-regular um, cheering you on and uh, uh, motivational texts from me, you can, you can text BGSD. That stands for, and this is adult language, bitches get shit done. Uh, 503-738-1029. Uh, I did not write that down, but I'm very glad that I can go watch this on YouTube later and get in on that chat. Um, thank you so much, Kelly Sue. This has been a blast. Uh, we can't thank you enough for coming on to the show. My pleasure. All right. Well, for everybody that's sticking around, we will be creating some really ridiculous and unnecessary uh, reboots via Mad Libs here in a moment. But before that, this is normally the part of the segment where I give you the pitch as to what is new going on with Pop Culture Classroom. We're doing that a little bit different today. So for those of you that may not know, Pop Culture Classroom, we do workshops and um Excuse me. We do pop culture based educational workshops in schools, libraries and community centers all around the Denver metro area. Um, we have been doing those throughout the pandemic and we have multiple workshops going on per week. And we actually had some really sweet thank yous come in from some recent things that we have done. One of our instructors, Dion, went out and taught an intro to comics class here not too long ago. We had some students write some thank you letters. So they said things like, thank you so much for meeting with us, learning how to draw an actual face was so fun, even though mine ended up being a little silly. Also, your artwork is amazing. Uh, thank you for teaching us how to draw faces. This was very helpful for me, especially since I was specifically looking forward to it. I've been doing well on side profiles and I've been wanting to learn the front of the face. So this was a perfect demonstration. Uh, and thank you for your time to come teach us class about how to write and draw characters in a comic book. I've learned a lot about writing and drawing characters from you, and I hope we can use these skills in the future. I really appreciate what you have done for us. Um, so that was from a local middle school where we did an intro to comic creation lesson so that they could then create comics about a poem that they read. Another thing that we've done lately is we created a video uh, for an elementary school's career day, all about careers in video games. Uh, this school is actually in Lufkin, Texas. Um, and I, in the mail, received all of these personalized thank you cards from all of these students um, who were really, really excited to hear about all the different types of careers in video games. And if they were, if they love writing or if they love telling people about new things or if they have leadership skills, where they can fit within the video game industry. This this is just an example of a lot of the workshops that we do for students here in the Denver metro area and beyond. And we need your help to be able to continue to do that. So this is our ask for donations. You can always donate to us at popcultureclassroom.org slash donate. Um, every little bit helps. It, it helps fund our instructors. It helps fund materials to go into schools and help them fall in love with learning and increase their literacy through the magic of pop culture. All right, Sydney. Yes. <laughs> are you ready to pitch some absolutely ridiculous uh, remakes and reboots? I'm ready. Okay. <laughs> so here is what we have done. We have created some Mad Libs uh, that will be reboots for first comics, and then we will do one for TV and film. Uh, and then we've got one for video games and then we've got one for film and TV and we've created these Mad Libs. So for you guys that are watching right now, we're going to be asking you for a set of items. Uh, so for this first one, we're, we're going to be rebooting a comic. We need you to give us ideas for hero names. So give us a hero, uh, a hero that you would like to see their story rebooted. And then we are looking for an adjective, a verb, uh, an alias name. So Captain Marvel is Carol Danvers. What is this hero's alias? Uh, a place a noun, a bureaucracy, like the FBI or something like that. Um, and then uh, a group of heroes. Um, so go ahead and put those in the chat. And while we are getting those ideas, Sydney, how much of a treat was Kelly Sue? That was awesome. She was great. Anything kind of jump out to you from, from that conversation with her? Um, I, well, I liked her comparison of, um, like stuff that she had worked on and somebody else taking like 
having that real, like, I wish you the best, but I'm not going to stalk your Facebook. <laughs> that's great. That's like, that's life advice too. Yes, that's yes, great. absolutely. Like mental health stuff. <laughs> um, but that was awesome. Um, and I just, I liked how she talked about the way that she approaches characters. You know, they are established characters, but that doesn't mean that she's limited, mm. you know? And, and so she had that really cool approach of like examining like the character's wound and things like that. So I thought that was really cool. Yeah. Um, that balance that you have to find, you know, we, I always think about, does someone think about the fan reaction, right? When they are writing or rebooting something. And what we kind of got from Kelly Sue was like, yes and no. Like you think about what makes that character, that character. Um, but you don't, necessarily go for that one particular thing that the audience loved you go for what defines that character and you have to have a reason for those changes yeah all right we have an established hero name supergirl so we're going to be rebooting supergirl okay so that means the other things that we need here we still need uh just an adjective a verb um an alias for supergirl it doesn't necessarily have to be her real one uh a place a noun a bureaucracy and a hero group. It was so interesting reading Captain Marvel today and seeing the Guardians of the Galaxy because uh, it was written, the one that I was reading was written back in like 2013, I believe. So before the Guardians movie came out and um, mm -hmm. especially as, as someone who's not as well versed in comics, seeing all the, the comparisons with the characters was really fun. Okay. So we're going to go super, super girl. Um, Sydney, why don't you give me an adjective here? Adjective. Um, hungry. Hungry. All right. I like it. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. What about a verb? Jumped. Jumped. Okay. Or jump, then, whichever, whatever tense you need. <laughs> Uh, jump, jumped. We'll figure it out. What about okay. a alias name? What is Supergirl's real name? I don't know the answer to that. Oh no, question. not not her like real real name, but like what what is the real oh, name that we give oh, in the Supergirl oh. reboot? Um, I was like Janine. Janine. <laughs> <laughs> That works, Janine. Oh, we did it's actually get in the chat. We got a uh, Peter Quill, so we'll use a uh, Peter Quill as the alias Peter of Supergirl. Quill. All right. Um, let's see. For a place, we got a suggestion of a desert island. Okay, I like that. Desert island. Um, let's see. Why don't you give me a, a bureaucracy name, Sydney? Um, CSI. The CSI. CSI. I was just watching CSI. Investigators. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's see. For a noun, we got a popsicle. I love that. Popsicle. Um, for adjective, we got forgotten. And then the hero name. This is a good one. Uh, well done, Graham Cracker Crest. We got Teen Titans. Okay. So just to recap here, our established hero that we're going to be rebooting is Supergirl. Our adjective was hungry. Our verb is jumped. The alias is Peter Quill. Uh, the place is a desert island. We have an adjective of forgotten. Uh, another noun, which is a popsicle. But the name of the bureaucracy is the CSI. And the hero group is Teen Titans. So here we go. Here is our rebooted version of Supergirl. Supergirl, Earth's hungriest hero, is back and jumping headfirst into an all-new ongoing adventure. As Peter, or as Supergirl, aka Peter Quill, makes a dramatic decision that will alter the course of their life and all of the desert island in the months to come. But as Peter Quill takes on a mission to return a forgotten popsicle to the desert island, Peter Quill lands in the middle of an uprising against the CSI. Peter Quill discovers that he has a history with the CSI. And when the bad guy tries to blackmail Peter Quill, it's payback time. Guest starring the Teen Titans. Nice. I don't know. That doesn't sound terrible. I would love to see that Peter doesn't Quill sound as terrible. <laughs> so this was actually taken from 
Captain Marvel Volume 1. This is the description that we found on Amazon, and then we just kind of changed around some of these words. Um, so that was our comic book reboot, learning all about Peter Quill, who's now Supergirl. And man, when I was reading about the history of Captain Marvel uh, and just like all the different Captain Marvels that there have been throughout the years, I it's not far-fetched for me to believe that, super, that you know, if they weren't different Marvel and DC, uh, but that Peter Quill might someday become Supergirl. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Crossover. <laughs> <laughs> so next, we're going to do a TV reboot. Sydney, do you want to lead us through this one? Yes. So for the TV reboot, let me get my my list here. Hang on. All right. So we are looking for a show name. We're looking for two characters from whatever show. Um, measurement of time. Um, so like... Um, am I looking at the right one here? <laughs> uh, yes, you should be. Okay. I was like, wait a second. I got, I got very confused. Measurement of time, um, a place, a business, two different adjectives, and then a third character and a fourth character. So yeah, whatever show so, you pick, those characters should be from that show. Whatever show we want to reboot. Yes. Um, and Matt, I'm going to rely on you to get those from the chat because I... I can't Perfect. See it. No worries. <laughs> I had it and it's gone and I don't know how to get it back. So. <laughs> All right. So give us a show name. Give us four characters from that show. And then a measurement of time, a place, a business, and an adjective. I'm trying to think. I guess Sabrina. I know you really enjoyed the Sabrina reboot, right? I did. Yes. I really enjoyed it. What did you um, And it was very different, obviously, from like the original Sabrina the Teenage Witch. Um, is is the movie it was, the like the ultimate source material for Sabrina? Because it was a the, movie, right? Think, the comics. Ah, okay. There's like Archie comics, which yes, I have not read, yes, and right, so okay. if I'm wrong about that, somebody please correct me. But I'm pretty sure the the comics are the original source material, um, and it somehow takes place in the same universe as Riverdale, which okay kind of confuses me but I'm um, I rolled with it it was it's great but yeah I really enjoyed it it was just very like my style of mm, mm. things that I enjoy <laughs> not mine that's okay my husband really <laughs> loved it but uh I was not a that's fan great. to be fair I probably didn't give it enough time <laughs> All right, Graham Cracker Crust is here with the recommendations Let's, we'll give it a couple more seconds to see if we get any more Okay. Graham Cracker Crust wants to reboot The Simpsons. Let's see if anybody, fantastic, anybody else has a different one. Oh no, we Chris has already got Simpsons on the scratch pad. So we'll do Simpsons. Uh, so we still need a measurement of time, a place, a business, and an adjective. See if we get those. I'm trying to think of other reboots that really stand out in my mind. Um, Cause I mean, they're the video games are all over the place. We did watch quite a bit of Animaniacs. So I don't think we finished this season, mm -hmm. uh, but it was quite funny. I did enjoy it. They rebooted or are rebooting the Rugrats. Yeah. On but Paramount Plus. Art style. Yeah. The art style is so different and it kind of freaks me out. <laughs> so the next season of RuPaul's Drag Race, RuPaul uh, Drag Race All-Stars season six is uh, streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. So while I've got that, because I'm going to have to get that, I'm going to at least give Rugrats yeah. a try. Just, I watched yeah. like a comparison of the original opening and the new opening and it would give me, it hit me in the nostalgia feels. Oh, <laughs> nice. All right, we got uh, ooh, we got a couple time. We got 13 nanoseconds and milliseconds uh, or light years. We have a few of those. Okay, so give me a place, Sydney. Um, the grocery store. The grocery store. Okay. And then actually, oh wait, you're leading this one. So let me. I'm gonna give yeah. you uh, a business. Okay. Um, let's see, rent a center. Rent a center. And then for an adjective, we're going to go sticky. Sticky. Good adjective. Yes. <laughs> As I was making these, that was the, at any time, like, I was like, I need an adjective. I was like, does sticky work? And I don't know why that was the one that, that I kept coming <laughs> back to, but. It stuck. Okay. So we have Simpsons, Homer and Flanders are characters one and two, uh, light years, a grocery store, a rent a center. Uh, oh, those might be, I think we only had one. Oh, the place is the grocery store. The business is rent a center. Uh, sticky. Yes. And then we have Marge and Santa's little helper. 
Awesome. Okay. So our Mad Lib. All right. Two characters from show. All right. Sorry, I'm, I'm figuring out where I'm putting these. So Homer and Flanders and the rest of the gang reunite for the Simpsons light years in the life. The premiere kicks off in a present day grocery store where character one Homer still runs the rent-a-center <laughs> and Flanders has experienced some sticky situations. As Flanders works through struggles and Homer deals with some, I'll just use sticky again, <laughs> sticky issues of his own. Viewers will see Marge handling the loss of her husband, Santa's little helper. <laughs> Marge and Santa's little helpers got together. Okay, I like that. Yes. I can see that in this reboot. <laughs> Homer runs a grocery store. That's excellent. Yep. And then that one was taken Light from. Years. Does anybody know what that might have been taken from? Anybody? Anybody got any clues? Uh, the loss of her husband Richard might uh, give it away there, or the time and the life. This one was taken from the Gilmore Girls reboot recently. Do you watch Gilmore Girls? Gilmore Girls. I watched a few episodes a while ago, but I never got into the Gilmore Girls. I never watched it. I don't it. know why. <laughs> I don't know why. I just, maybe because I didn't like watch it like consecutively. It was just one of those that would come on TV and I would watch it and I'd be like, I don't like it. Oh, and I would turn it off. I'm good. I'm okay. <laughs> <You know? laughs> all right. We're going to reboot a video game next. Video game. So here's what I need from you all. Uh, I need the name of a game that you want to reboot. A year, an adjective, a body part, a genre. Uh, like a video game genre. So we're talking shooter, horror, side-scroller, RPG, whatever. Uh, a number, a noun, an enemy type uh, that you might see in a game, maybe the game that we're rebooting, another noun, and then two characters. Bonus points if those two characters are from whatever game we mentioned. Right, apparently we're missing out on Gilmore Girls, uh, says Christy in the chat. <laughs> Also, I'm, I've I'm, been told that <laughs> I'm glad to know that we only need to watch the first RoboCop. Um, that's another one of those I haven't seen yet. It was before my time. All right. So a game, a year, an adjective, a body part, a genre, a number, a noun, an enemy type, another noun and two characters. <laughs> At McLaughlin just says virtual reality game. <laughs> Virtual reality game. Ooh, Earthworm Jim. Did you ever play Earthworm Jim back in the day? No. It was ridiculous. It was like on the Sega Genesis, and you are literally an earthworm in a spacesuit. Oh my god. <laughs> no, I never played that. <laughs> it's like a little platforming game. That's I like awesome. I like Earthworm Jim. Uh, let's use Big Toe. I like that for the body part. Uh, let's see. Give me give me a year, Sydney. Um, 1975. Good year. Good year. <laughs> uh, the, also a band, the 1975. Um, yes. let's see. What about a genre? What's your favorite video game genre? Um, I am totally blanking on genres. You said side scroller, RPG. Oh, oh, okay. Virtual reality game is the genre Virtual here reality. that was being, being recommended. There it is. Okay. Perfect. Oh, okay. For enemy type, uh, the Demogorgon. I do like that. Nice. All right. So now we just need a noun. Sydney, give me a noun. In fact, give me two nouns. Noun. Um, cat. And um, <laughs> what's a noun? Um, computer. <laughs> cat and computer. Excellent. I'm just looking around at things that I see around me. <laughs> And then uh, for characters, I guess we got to go with Jim. Uh, I, for some reason, I remember a sheep in Earthworm Jim. I could be making that up. It's been a good 20 years since I played that game, but we'll go with sheep as the second character. All right. Okay. Here's our video game reboot. And uh, video game reboots, this is just like you would see a video game on, on Amazon. So this is just bullet points. Here we go. All right. Uh, oh, I already lost it. Earthworm Jim, based on the release of 1975, but completely rebuilt for 
Oh, we didn't get the adjective. We'll go with sticky. Stickier narrative experience. <laughs> a new over-the-toe camera mode and modernized control scheme. A more modern take on the survival virtual reality experience. Earthworm Jim delivers breathtaking photorealistic uh, visuals in 16K. We didn't get a number, but I'll make it up. Uh, let's see. The Demogorgon is brought to life with horrifyingly realistic wet gore effects. Cats react in real time, taking instant visible damage, making every uh, computer count. <laughs> and enjoy separate playable campaigns for both Jim and the sheep. Nice. I'd like to play as a sheep. Other great game with sheep, Ratchet and Clank. Uh, wow. You have the gun that turns things into sheep. Uh, yeah. Very excited about the new Ratchet and Clank game. And that came from the Resident Evil 2 remake. Uh, the wet gore effect was something that they talked about a lot when that game came out. Um, yeah, and the new over-the-shoulder camera angle. Um, but for our game, it's over the toe. Over, over the toe. Earthworm Jim's toe. Fantastic. I feel like that would make things very difficult to play. Okay. <laughs> we got one more. We're going to wrap this up with one more, and this one would be more. our film reboot. So, Sydney, if you want to take the wheel for this one. All right. So, for film, we need a type of person. We need a number. We need the name of a movie. We need two characters, preferably from that movie. I guess they don't have to be, but, you know, they could be. On the um, screen, you're actually y'all actually seeing uh, when I tested these with my husband. Those were his <laughs> answers, so you can just the ignore example. those things. <laughs> <laughs> so a corporation such as Amazon, um, two adjectives, a noun from the movie, and three celebrities. I mean, I do really like Brad Pitt, Tom Hardy, and Lakeith Stanfield. Yeah, all of those are fantastic yeah. gentlemen. We're watching uh, Yasuke on Netflix right now. Um, it's spelled yes, Yasuki or Yasuke, but, uh, apparently it's pronounced Yasuke. Um, and it's about a black samurai in Japan. It's a really cool anime. Nice. With Lakeith Stanfield. That's what brought that up. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see what film have you seen Cruella? Are you planning on seeing Cruella? I, I have not seen it. Um, my original thought when I first heard about it was why are you trying to make me feel empathy for a character who just wants to make coats out of puppies but apparently it's very very good so i'm kind okay. of changing my i'll probably end up watching it and i mm. love emma stone so I, but at first i was like does this does corella really need a backstory but uh, yeah yeah we'll see Maybe when does, it's not, apparently it was good <laughs> when it's not 30 dollars, we'll, mm -hmm. we'll i'll check it out Ooh, i like type of person is a beekeeper that's a good one um, and then for this one, an adjective can be mysterious. Excellent recommendations mysterious here. Mysterious beekeeper. Uh, for a number, we have 0. 0.0001. All right, keep them coming, guys. Let's see what this uh, film reboot turns out to be. So far, I think our best one was the comic reboot. Um, mm -hmm. I would be interested to play Earthworm Jim with Over the Toe, but yeah. I don't think it would be good. And worms don't have toes. That's the <laughs> other problem there. <laughs> Wet gore effect on Earthworm Jim. <laughs> <laughs> Beavis and Butthead. Okay, that will be our uh, characters one and two. Excellent, excellent. So we still need one more adjective and then a noun. Oh, and the movie that we're rebooting. We haven't chosen yeah. the movie we're rebooting yet. I, I, I wouldn't mind seeing a good... Well, I don't know. I say that. I was going to say I wouldn't mind seeing a good Heathers reboot, but maybe we shouldn't touch Heathers. Yeah. Uh, maybe that reboot that I did watch just proved that... You can make it a musical. If you ever get a chance <laughs> to see Heathers the musical, please watch Heathers the musical. It's excellent. Uh, but I don't know if we needed the uh, the reboot. Oh, my God. Adjective sloppy. That's a good one. Sloppy. All right, I don't know and what then, movie I want to see rebooted. Uh, let's let's reboot Lord of the Rings. I don't think we need a Lord of the Rings reboot, no. but what if we <laughs> <laughs> we? I'm actually we're watching those right now, and I was like, it's time wise, it's due. You know, special effects yeah. wise, it's due, but it's so iconic. But they're so good. <laughs> they're so. My opinion on that has changed a little bit with this most recent watch. They are very good. Don't get me wrong, but there are, there are problems that could be addressed with 
a reboot, but it's yeah. so iconic. I don't know. Yeah. Celebrity. Oh, the Kardashians. Okay, because there are three of... I think there's more than three total, but we can go with Kim. Uh, uh, Courtney. Courtney and Chloe. Chloe, yeah. Those Kardashians. <laughs> they just celebrated their 20th year of keeping up with their Kardashians. Can you believe that? That's crazy. All right, I think we've got all of our all of our recommendations here. So send right. me whenever you're ready. Okay. I'm gonna I gotta see the Mad Lib. Hang on. Okay. The beekeeper icons who first hit the screen 0. 0.001 years ago in Lord of the Rings are back. When Beavis and Butthead discover that oh, we don't have a corporation. Oh no. Matt Amazon. name a corporation. When Amazon. we discover that Amazon is rebooting an old movie based on them, it's game on as the mysterious duo embark on another sloppy mission to stop the uh noun from a movie. What uh, movie the ring. Like? The, the, to stop the ring all over again with all star cameos from Kim, Chloe, and Courtney Kardashian. All right, so <laughs> Lord of the Rings, but it's with Beavis and Butthead. Uh, and, the and the Kardashians are in it. The Kardashians are the elves. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that would be absolutely ridiculous. Uh, I would watch it just for the, the fun of it. Yeah. There's a trailer for a new thing they're doing on Netflix. It's called uh, America the Movie. I think. Oh, Have no. you seen this? No. It's an animated uh, comedy that it is star studded, but it just made me. It's like George Washington uh, and, you know, doing ridiculous things and there's lasers and all kinds yeah. of stuff. <laughs> um, it just made me the ridiculous aspect of it. Like, I want to watch that because of how ridiculous it looks. <laughs> That's what I would do for this reboot for sure. Um, it's like when Paris Hilton was in movies for a little bit, when she was in like House of Wax and she was in yeah. uh, Repo, the genetic rock opera. Yeah. Um, seeing the Kardashians. She was in an if episode they could, of Supernatural, too. Right? If the Kardashians can <laughs> hold their own, I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Yeah. Well, thank you guys for indulging us in that ridiculousness. <laughs> um, Sydney, it has been wonderful having you back Yay. on Pop Stream. I can't wait to have you back for the next episode. Yes. I uh, will happily can, come back. <laughs> remind people, where can they find you? I am on both Twitter and Instagram at Rem at Sidnaps. Should be right down there. Perfect. Um, yeah. Excellent. Well, in two weeks for our next episode of Popstream, I will not be here, but Tajian uh, and our rotating cast member Tara will be joined in the Popstream Learning Lounge by Tony Weaver Jr., uh, who's an award-winning writer and educator and a member of the Forbes 30 Under 30, CEO of Weird Enough Productions, uh, which is a social impact organization that uses diverse stories and comics to empower young people and the adults that support them. Um, they'll be talking all about manga in the classroom on that episode, so don't miss out on that. And next month, we'll be back with another episode of Popstream to talk about the future of books and graphic novels with a to-be-announced guest. Finally, thank you to all of our listeners and supporters. We could not be here if it weren't for you. Don't forget to make sure you subscribe to PopStream on YouTube, Twitch, and your favorite podcast services. And don't forget that you can follow Pop Culture Classroom on social media. Um, we are at Pop Classroom on Twitter and at uh, Pop Culture Classroom on most things, I believe. You can even help us in our educational endeavors by donating at popcultureclassroom.org slash donate. That helps fund, th fund things like our educational comic series, colorful history, downloadable resources for educators and workshops in schools, libraries, and community centers across the Denver metro area. Thank you guys for joining us. Happy Pride Month. Go be a little bit gay and go revel in your dirtiness. We'll see you next time.